This is London. The Air Ministry have just issued the following communique. In the early hours of this morning, a force of Lancaster's Obama Command, led by Wing Commander G.P. Gibson, DFCL DFC, attacked with mines the dams at the Myrna and Sorba reservoirs. Reconnaissance later established the Myrna Dam had been breached over a length of 100 yards and that the power station below had been swept away by the resulting floods. The Ada Dam, which controls the headwaters of the Vesa and Fulda valleys, was also attacked and was reported as breached. The attacks were pressed home from a very low level with great determination and coolness in the face of fierce resistance. Eight of the Lancasters are missing. It was on the night of May the 16th, 1943, that that raid was carried out. It wasn't filmed at the time, but the reconstruction was made for the later feature film, The Dam Busters. To break the dams, a special bomb had to be constructed. And the man who invented that bomb still works at Weybridge in the same offices as he did before the war. He was also the inventor of one of the early British airships and the designer of the Wellington bomber. The inventor of the dam busting bomb was, of course, Dr. Barnes Wallace. And I asked him what put the idea into his head. Merely thinking of the shortest way in which an engineer could bring a war to an end. The obvious answer is cut off the power and stop the manufacture of steel in the hostile country. My first idea was to drop a very big bomb into the lake itself hoping that the waves would break down the dam, but experiments showed that that was quite impossible. It would, required a, it would have required a bomb weighing about 40,000 pounds. Barnes Wallace felt there must be some other way to destroy so vital a target. He knew the dams didn't exist just to provide washing up water. They were essential for German industry. There is only one river in the whole Ruhr Valley which is sufficiently pure water to be used in the smelting of steel. And it takes between 100 and 150 tons of steel, of water, to make one ton of steel. And so they had to confine the waters of the Myrna for this purpose. Once we bust that dam, uh, although they were surrounded by rivers, the Vupa, the Emscher, and so on, it was no good to them. The heart of the German munitions industry lay in the Ruhr. supply for this vital industry was contained in the Mona, the Sorpa, and the Ada Downs. If these dams could be breached, Barnes Wallace calculated, the damage that would be done would be far greater than could ever be done by orthodox type bombing raids. Breaking the dams was going to be difficult. Stretching across the lake, protecting the dam, the Germans had put two long booms of steel casks floating on the water, from which depended the very stout steel netting, which would, uh, nothing could float, over, uh, along the top of the water, nothing could go below the water, and of course an ordinary bomb would be absolutely useless against a masonry construction 120 feet thick. So you realized that you had to make something which skipped? No. Uh, the skipping was only incidental. What one had to do was to make something which would cling to the face of the dam as it sank until it got to the optimum position. Now, if you have ever played golf and sliced a ball, you will realize that putting a bit of spin on a ball gives it a very considerable uh, force. 
in a direction which you generally don't want it to go. And uh, I had once thought that if I put backspin onto a ball impacting on water, it would shoot forward as it does. And then when it hit the parapet of the dam and began to sink downwards, it would move in towards the dam. Was that a moment of inspiration or did you work it out? Oh no, it took weeks and months. There are no moments of inspiration. You, you work at a problem until you find a solution. I don't believe in inspiration of that kind. Barnes Wallace experimented with a model to see if his idea worked. No film of it was made at the time, but the model was reconstructed for the film of the Dam Busters. Michael Redgrave played the part of Barnes Wallace. Watch it! Fire! Officialdom was impressed enough to allow him to continue his experiments in the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington. Three, two, one. This is one of the actual balls that we used to shoot up the tank. And we've actually made a ball of lead. This is uh, a light alloy. Travel 500 feet on the surface of the water. It, it's really a marvelous sight to see. But throughout this experimental period, Barnes Wallace encountered skepticism in high places, particularly as far as Lord Charwell was concerned. Charwell's attitude uh, was against the whole thing because he said, firstly, the dams were not a target of any interest. That's very strange. Why should you have thought that? You cannot expect me to explain the workings of Lord Charwell's mind and he is now beyond consultation in this world. It looked as if the project would get no further. But then someone came from the Navy to see Barnes Wallace on another matter, heard about the advancing bomb, and arranged a demonstration. I nearly drowned two admirals in the, um, in the ship tank at Teddington. I had moored a battleship, a model battleship, across the tank, about 300 feet away from the catapult and then fired one of these bombs skipping along the water and true to form it hit the side of the ship went underneath and actually came out the other side now there is no railing along that side of the tank and these two admirals were so interested at this wonderful sight they very nearly fell in so it was the navy that gave barnes wallace his first full-scale trials although the naval weapon was much smaller than the dam busting bomb the trials began in December 1942. I believe you acted as bomb MA yourself in some of the trials. In dropping the first trials, yes. Had you done it before? Good heavens, no. Nobody had ever done it before. This must have been rather an extraordinary experience, hasn't it? I suppose so. There was one occasion when one of the trials with the naval weapon which travelled at 350 miles an hour did not go quite according to plan. The photographer and was situated on a mound on which the ancient church of Recalva is built. They're in ruins now. And he was working through a telephoto lens, which of course destroys all sense of perspective to the observer. And as this bomb started to come on shore, all the air marshals and the admirals, led, I'm afraid, by myself, doubled like rabbits behind the church to take shelter. But to our astonishment, the photographer went on taking his photograph. When all danger was over, the bomb had embedded itself in the hill about 10 feet below his camera. I dashed out and said, by Jove, Wolves, that's the bravest thing I've ever seen. You deserve the George Cross for that. And he turned a sour-looking face to me and said, you might have told me the damn thing was coming. Other well, tests followed in Scotland, and this time the dummy began to behave impeccably. The Navy, of course, were interested in the bouncing bomb as an alternative to torpedoes. So they arranged for dummy attacks to be made on an old French battleship, the Courbet. And on one of these attacks, the bomb went straight through the poor old battleship's hull. You'll see it again in a moment in slow motion. for the fire brigade uh, from Glasgow because all the 
boiler room fires were out, there was no steam, and we made such a leak in the ship that they were afraid she would sink. How come that the RAF then took it up, so to speak, after, after the Navy had taken the lead? Why didn't the Navy pursue it? And uh, Lord Mountbatten, <coughs> um, uh, had to say that um, although the Navy normally operated over water, when the water happened to be an inland lake, the Navy had no rights to act. And therefore one had to go on pegging away at the Royal Air Force. Who gave the most help in this? Uh, I would say firstly Sir Henry Tizard, who was scientific advisor to the air staff at the time, and following him, Sir Thomas Merton. But at least those films we've seen of the trials of the bomb proved that it could work, and this put Barnes Wallace in a much stronger position. I think the turning point in the whole episode was uh, when Mutt Summers, our test pilot, took me down to High Wycombe Bomber Headquarters and we showed a film to Bomber Harris um, in which he, he was able to see a ball skipping along the water and then going down and hugging the face of a model dam which we put in the tank. I, I rather fancy that the act of seeing that happen probably convinced him that it was a practical proposition. Harris gave the project his blessing, and a Lancaster was put at Barnes Wallace's disposal to do the final tests. We um, gutted the whole of the bomb bays, at least uh, Avro's um, gutted the whole of the bomb bay in order to make room for our bomb to go in. So how did you actually spin it when it was in the aircraft? It was held between two uh, uh, wheels uh, on swiveling arms, and one of those wheels was driven by means of, curiously enough, uh, a Vickers Danny hydraulic engine, which was designed and used for steering submarines. But we used it for spinning up a bomb. And of course, we were, I was able to get as many as I wanted from because. Were there any problems, while, so to speak, once you'd started? Did, uh, did you have to modify these? Well, yes, right? quite a lot. Um, I was told that steel was so scarce that I couldn't possibly get any billets big enough to make the dies to press the spherical shell of the bomb. And of course, a spherical shell runs very much truer and further than any other form. And so I got, I made a cylindrical bomb, about four foot six in diameter and about seven feet long, which was then turned into a sphere by the shipwrights at our naval construction works at Barrow and Furness. There was one occasion, wasn't there, when you were actually told to stop working on the project? Oh, yes. I was told to stop work on the 23rd of February, 1943, and told that the whole thing was to go ahead again on the 26th of February. What was your reaction when you were told to stop? Well, I thought that they had not left me enough time. The dams would be at their fullest. I had written a paper, as a matter of fact, for the benefit of Lord Charwell, to try to convince him that these dams were erected for some useful purpose. And in the paper I showed that the dams would be, the reservoirs would be full in the middle of May. <coughs> See, mid-Germany has a continental climate and the reservoirs are filled up by the melting snows in the mountainous districts. And that only left me with eight weeks in to do the whole thing, design the bomb and everything. On March the 15th, when Commander Guy Gibson was put in charge of a new squadron to train it for a particular type of low fire, the film of the downbusters showed how they went to bite it. The bombs had to be dropped at the right point in the lake, not too far away from the dam, or they'd sink before they reached it, not too close, or they might skip over the top. The answer turned out to be remarkably simple. 
The dams had two towers, some distance apart, and the distance was known. Two pieces of wood nailed together gave the bomb aimer all he needed to know. When the towers on the dams were in line with the nails on the wood, that was the time to drop the bomb. The squadron practiced on dams in North Wales. gauge the aircraft's exact height, never easy at night over water. An idea was suggested which neatly did the trick. Two spotlights, fore and aft, under the plane, pointing downwards at an angle, so when they lay side by side, the pilot would know that he was at precisely the correct height to release the bomb. Up a bit. So we had to run the cylinders naked after all. I remember that night, my staff and I drove all round Ramsgate and Margaret, which were practically deserted, of course, and bought up every mallet and chisel in both towns, and we spent all night hacking these great wooden staves off the bombs so that Gibson could go on running trials with cylinders on the next day. It was not until the end of April, less than three weeks before the raid was due, that all was ready to film the practice drop of a live bomb in the sea. Lancaster was hit on its run in. The third dropped its bomb successfully, so did the fourth. Yet still the down stood. A fifth run in had to be ordered, but the fourth bomb had done its work. It's gone! Look! My God! The co 
code word nigger for a successful attack was radioed home. It was to be heard twice that evening as the Ada Dam was also breached, and in the valleys below, the destruction was fearful. An author has been in Germany making a number of inquiries only this year. And they find from German reports that very nearly as much water was lost out of the saw pit as out of any of the other dams. And this particular author, of whom I'm thinking, has got hold of Goering's diaries, scribbled in pencil on bits of scrap paper, just as we had to use in England. And apparently the effect was, in Germany, was absolutely tremendous. And even Hitler himself wrote referring to the cat catastrophe in the West. The thing which is puzzling, considering the success of the bombs, is why they were not used again in the course of the war. That I cannot tell you. I went down two or three days after the raid with a list of 300 other dams and gave it to Sir Arthur Harris, but uh, I suppose his losses had been so great not over the dams, only two machines were lost over the dams, um, that he didn't care to risk it. There was a curious postscript to the dam busting story. Security here simply couldn't bear to release the explanation of how the bomb worked, the backspin principle, although it was widely known. I was a junior officer in the RAF at the time, and yet within months I knew the principle on which the bomb worked. And yet it wasn't until, what, two or three years ago that this was released by security. It is so. As long as the battleship remained of importance to the Royal Navy, they regarded this weapon as top secret because there is no defense against it, whatever. These things come at you at a speed of 300 miles an hour, looking rather like the Loch Ness Monster, and you can't shoot them down or do anything about it. And um, when the battleship went out of fashion, and somebody wanted to make a film for some purpose or another, I've forgotten what. I wrote to the Secretary of State for Air and said, look here, the Germans know all about this because they captured uh, the wreckage of a machine. The Russians know all about it because we sent them a full set of drawings as they were our allies and wanted to know how it was done. The Americans know all about it because we equipped an American squadron to destroy the Japanese Navy. The French know, everybody knows except the English who paid for it. Do you think that the secrecy ban might now be removed? And I got an answer by return of post saying, freed herewith. I've been told an amazing story only in the last week or two of one of the machines which was destroyed over the Murney Dam. Two from one of the machines, two men escaped. Although they dropped from a height of only about 200 feet, their parachutes did partially open. One of them hid in a drain for several days until he was discovered by one of the Hitler Jugend. He was then parched for want of water, he had none. And all he could say was, water, water. The police who took him in charge sent for the sergeant, the sergeant sent for the lieutenant, the lieutenant sent for the commander. To each one he said, water, water. When the commander came along, he said, Dasser, Dasser, we have no Dasser, you English bastard.